Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Bob and his crew for an awesome event. Really, really excited. Today, uh, tonight, I'm going to talk. I have two talks, and I'm going to try to make it clear because I'm going to get a little tired. Um, one is how, uh, one of the subjects is how the African American mind affects the environment in Africa. I'm going to expand it a little bit to include uh, animal agriculture uh, affecting Africa because really that's, that's the, where the problem is. Uh, and that includes factory farming, meat and dairy uh, consumption. Uh, both in Africa and outside of Africa, uh, especially in the United States, uh, the American diet that African Americans also eat. So I think that would be a better uh, subject to uh, talk about. So uh, the consequences of animal agriculture and the environment um, is caused by such things as you know, climate change, de deforestation, land degradation, and in turn, these things cause water scarcity, drought, and loss of biodiversity. And these things are happening uh, very much so in Africa. Um, you know, climate change, increased climate change, is affecting the whole world. Africa is not the source of it. Uh, Africa is a victim of climate change. Climate change is coming from you know the uh, environmental damage being done by uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and factory farms all over the planet, especially in North America and Europe. Um, so, you know, Africa doesn't have a lot to do with it, although that is changing, and I'll talk about that uh, soon. Um, so, like I said, Africa is a continent that will suffer the most under climate change. Um, and these temperature rises will trigger sharp declines in crop yields and tropical regions. And as estimated in Africa, 5 to 10 percent uh, of Africans will be malnourished, undernourished, and will suffer diseases that are related to increased temperature, like malaria. Um, and 50% of all malnutrition-related death occur in Africa, unfortunately. While a 2 degree centigrade rise in temperature will increase the people affected by hunger, potentially by 200 million worldwide. And most, most of it is going to be in Africa. Um, Globally, Africa and especially Western Asian countries will suffer the largest crop losses, while these regions are highly dependent on agriculture and have the largest limits in the purchasing power. Um, the other thing that's happening, and I've seen it happening in my own country, in Ethiopia, where I was born, uh, wildfires are you know, raged time from time to time. Uh, there's no way to stop it. The other thing that happens a lot in Africa is deforestation. And deforestation and land degradation, the main reasons for it, and it's, you know, uh, both worldwide and especially in Africa. Uh, agriculture is one of the main reasons for it, and 80% uh, uh, of that is used, uh, of, you know, agriculture is to raise animals for food and grow crops to feed them, especially in developed countries. Uh, in Africa, uh, animals are roaming free, a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, pasture lists are going from region to region and destroy uh, the crops, uh, the land, uh, because of the animals are overgrazing. Deforestation is responsible for probably 20 to 25% of global warming due to the release of CO2 stored in the trees worldwide, uh, cleaning land for livestock grazing, especially in the Amazon. Uh, and agricultural production for cash crops, which is happening in Africa a lot, is another reason. And crop production for animal feed, spray, especially things like soy beans, uh, is happening in the United States, but also in Africa. Ethiopia is a good example. Uh, Ethiopia is uh, exporting soy beans to the Middle East, uh, while you know, it's steep to the southern. Um, but there's also, also local reasons for deforestation in Africa. And uh, one of the main ones is, you know, 90% of the continent uses wood for fuel for cooking. And I've seen that from my personal experience. Uh, I, my nonprofit organization uh, does mission, medical missions, and I've led a couple of medical missions to rural Ethiopia. And we can go, we can go for three to four to five hours driving in single trains. 
Um, Ethiopia, when I was growing up, was had dense forests. It was like 50% of forest. By uh, 2009, when I went to Ethiopia, it was less than 2%. That's how much damage has been done. And most of it is because there's no electricity, no energy, so that people are using it for uh, for cooking. Now, in, not so much in Ethiopia, but especially in the Congo, commercial logging uh, is a big problem, just as it is in uh, the Amazon. The difference is in, in Africa, in the Congo, what's happening is the rainforest protects a lot of these wild animals. And when the logging companies come in and destroy the, the, the trees, uh, the forests, these animals are exposed. And what happens is, uh, a lot of people start killing these animals, and uh, they're considered you know, what they call bushy, uh, which is very expensive. It's uh, considered, considered a delicacy uh, and uh, very expensive. And these animals are being slaughtered because of it. Um, in 1990, in Africa, 30% uh, of the world's tropical forests, uh, it had 30% of the tropical forests. In 2009, less than 20, like I said, in the year, it's much, much less. Uh, the rate of defore deforestation exceeds the global annual average of 0.8%. Uh, and then pop population pressure exacerbates the problem. When I was growing up in Ethiopia, when I was 14, 15 years old, um, Ethiopia had 25 million people. 2013, 2014, close to 100,000, 100 million. That is a fourfold increase in the population. And you know, it's a hush hush uh, story discussion. Uh, population is a very sensitive uh, issue, but it is a problem. And it is a problem that cannot be ignored and should be uh, you know, publicly discussed. Because uh, the animals have nowhere to go, and there's not enough land uh, for both humans and animals to coexist on, this, on that uh, continent. When I was growing up, my, my grandfather used to tell me, uh, in the capital city, you could hear lions roar uh, 20, 30 uh, kilometers outside the city. Now you can drive for eight hours or nine hours and see, not, forget the lions, you won't even see uh, hyenas. Um, they've been decimated, killed, uh, and some of them uh, have escaped into Kenya. And that's, you know, a lot of the Kenyan wildlife is thriving because a lot of Ethiopian wildlife uh, are not being protected and so they are going into <coughs> Kenya. So popular, population growth is a big problem. Um, land degradation, increased demand for meat, equals increased demand for raising food animals, and then animals grazing on grassland, which is a big problem. Uh, Overgrazing, which, which is something that again I've seen a lot in Ethiopia, causes soil erosion, reduction in soil depth, and soil organic matter and soil fertility leading to future impairments of uh, land productivity and the, the ability of uh, the soil to hold water. And of course then what happens? You've got water scarcity and drought that follows because, because of deforestation, climate change, and all the other things that I just talked about. One fourth of the African population uh, currently experiences uh, high water stress. Um, the problem with water is becoming very severe. Major lakes and rivers in Africa are just shrinking every day. Uh, for example, the big lakes, Lake Chad and Chad Republic, is gone down by 10% in the last couple of years. Lake Nakura in, in Kenya, which I've been to, a beautiful lake where a lot of not only human beings uh, um, use it, uh, the animals also uh, uh, need the lake to exist and it's disappearing. Lake Dan in Ethiopia, the, the source of the Blue Nile, is disappearing. Uh, the Zambezi River, uh, shared by eight African countries uh, in South Africa, are all shrinking. Uh, and the fear is, and this is, this is a real fear that the water stress that African countries are feeling is going to be, uh, lead to resource wars. And it's, always, it's already happening in the Nile, uh, the Nile River. Um, Ethiopia is building a dam 
and the Egyptian government is um, has uh, threatened to bomb the the uh, bank. It's a big big problem because the the Egyptian government, the Egyptian people, um, depend on the Nile uh, for a lot of things, and so these um, resource wars are popping up all over the continent, and it's going to get worse. And the what it is, what oil is now, is going to, as, a, as a source of uh, you know, conflict, water is going to be the one in the future, especially in Africa. 88% of water is used by agriculture in Africa, that's another problem. And meat production decreases water resources, and there are a lot of African countries that are exporting meat to uh, other countries. If you guys are exporting meat to um, the Middle East, live animals and dead animals are cut up into pieces. Botswana um, does the same thing. Uh, there's, they are actually exporting meat uh, to the European Union. In Africa, water shortages afflict 300,000 people, killing 6,000 per year. Uh, the glaciers of, on top of African mountains like Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, are disappearing, leading to water scarcity. In 2050, human population expected to reach 9 billion. Water will be a problem. Another problem that is happening both in the Amazon and in the, you know, the Congo is wild animals die when animal agriculture usurps their habitats to raise livestock and grow feed crops. Some displaced species, for example, in the dwindling Congo, are now in danger of extinction. Um, and then, of course, plant and animal species are also dying um, at alarming rates. Some of the plants most endangered species in Africa, including the black rhino, African elephant, the cheetah, the mountain gorilla, rhinos, the rhinos, uh, are all disappearing because of you know, population growth, because of agriculture, because of deforestation, and because of you know uh, hunting. Um, so now we come to intensive park program. Uh, you know, the one country that has uh, the most mechanized and most modern uh, uh, factory farming is South Africa. However, um, there are other countries that are not lagging far behind. Uh, in other African countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, factory farming is still in certain stages of development and remains technologically unrefined, but they are growing and very quickly, and they're getting support from governments, from agencies like the United States, uh, USAID, the Bill Gates uh, uh, Foundation, and other entities. Um, the overcrowding mechanization and crude production methods is that, is that typify factory farming have not yet been systematically applied in these nations, although that is, like I said, changing. For example, and Nigeria is one of the fastest growing countries that is developing factory farming. There are 10 commercial farms in Nigeria fully automated, doing exactly what they do here in the United States. The poultry industry is highly involved in Ghana. Um, and then, like I said, multinationals like you know, uh, governments and corporations are moving into African countries. Um, factory farming uh, is, is not only growing, but um, um, the expansion of fast food outlets is also growing rapidly. And big uh, corporations are moving in. Tyson's, Tyson's food um, is hooked up in Ghana. Uh, Mozambique is working with the USAID to develop their poultry industry. Kentucky Fried Chicken have outlets in Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, and I bet you many other countries that I don't know about. I am uh, co-authoring a book right now uh, called Africa and uh, Her Animals, and I'm writing the, the chapter on factory farming in Africa, and I've been researching this thing, and it's scary that every year things are just moving so fast, it's, it's unbelievable. In the next five to ten years, Africa will be fully mechanized in a lot of the major countries, including my own country. So, livestock production from intensive agriculture production that's even ha ha happening in Africa 
devastates the livelihood of our local farm farmers, not, not to speak of what it does to the animals, destroys rural structures and communities. It's an inefficient use of food sources and production that makes uh, food supply insecure, causes what's called vertical integration, dislocation of farmers from rural settings to urban settings, where uh, they become you know, criminals, uh, homeless, uh, because they're not educated, they have you know, job experience, they have no uh, relatives, families, or friends to go to, they have no money, and they, you know, they, they become homeless and dangerous to society. Uh, by 2020, countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa will be the leading production of animal pro uh, producers of animal products with industrial animal production, likely being the predominant method, uh, uh, predominant method, and production method. And you know, we can talk about veganism in, uh, in the U.S. and promoting veganism, and I totally agree with it. I don't have an issue with that. But the reality is, the problem is not the U.S. I mean, right now it seems like we are the problem, but the problem really is the developing countries, especially India and China, where, um, you know, uh, meat, meat eating is becoming, a, you know, something that's uh, very common. A lot of people, when they uh, move from poverty into, you know, um, middle class uh, status, get, you know, uh, acquire the middle class, status and have a little money, the first thing you want to do is uh, eat meat. And um, it's a sign of, you know, advanced improvements of one's life. And so that is what's happening in these countries, and that's where the issue is. So um, we can talk about veganism in the United States, which has 200, 300 million people, but uh, you, you have well, you know, 1.5 billion people in uh, China or two billion, whatever their number is, and same thing in India and in the other BRIC countries. Uh, the problem is huge, and it's it's um, you know just uh, vegan outreach is not going to be enough. Sixty percent of African workers are employed in the agricultural sector. Animal agriculture, owned by large foreign corporations, threaten the livelihoods of millions of traditional farmers. They just throw them out of their land, basically good, supported by the government. Uh, there's um, a grab for land in, uh, in Africa right now, and it's happening in all the countries, including Ethiopia, where Indian corporations, Chinese corporations, even you know, other Middle Eastern countries come in and get land almost for free, um, kick out the inhabitants of those lands, and construct uh, factory farms or produce uh, crops for uh, catch. And so these farmers are displaced and have, like I said, nowhere to go. And like I described earlier, they resort to crime, they become homeless, they live in rural, rural uh, areas, uh, I mean in uh, urban areas, where they live in overcrowded situations. Um, loss of agriculture by the diversity is another issue. Uh, because African farmers lose the ability to continue uh, the ability to continue complex farming, farming systems learned over generations. The knowledge of specific crop varieties and uh, uh, they, uh, that how they best grow. The knowledge of what to do with marginal lands is not situated for industrial production. So, what is the solution? I mean, there are many, you know, these, these issues are multifactorial, they're very complex. Uh, and there are a lot of different approaches to it, but one of the things that we can do is, and would help uh, very quickly and uh, uh, change the, you know, shift things to, towards a better world would be by feeding Africa a plant-based diet. Like uh, Milton said before, the basic diet of, of Africans has always been plant-based. Plant um, when I travel to eat, uh, northern Ethiopia to rural parts of Ethiopia, when you're treating patients, 99% of them have never, they don't know what meat is. They don't eat meat. Uh, and so that's what we need to revert back to. The problem is urbanization, uh, people uh, going up the economic ladder, s supposedly civilization and modernity is causing some of the problems that we're facing. 
Ethiopians, for example, you know, having a big fat belly is supposed to be a sign of wealth uh, in my culture. And so uh, when people start improving their lives and uh, making more money, the first thing they want to do is eat junk and uh, the American diet, which is what's causing the medical issues and environmental issues. So resorting back to what we used to eat as Africans is what, need, what is needed. Uh, locally, like I said, stop eating meat, period. Um, if, 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 if even a reduction of 15% uh, would uh, increase, decrease the uh, malnourished children's number by 3.6 million, but imagine doing it 100%, it would be amazing. And then globally, same thing, promoting a plant-based diet for Africa and the world. And I think that would help uh, go a long way to uh, bring in some change. Thank you for uh, listening to this. Of these entrances displayed signs on top. I don't know if you can see this, but it says 
female slave dungeon and the male slave dungeon. So these were the entrances into the dungeons. Um, and this uh, dungeon, this doorway led into a window, windowless dungeon, very human and damp, with no light penetrating into the darkness. There was an indescribable odor that uh, I've never uh, experienced before. Um, according to this, to the to our guide, 400 women were put into this into this place. They were they were, they were stored in this filthy place, and honestly, I don't think it could hold more than 100 people. Slave traders kidnapped people from the interior parts of Africa, and um, with the help sometimes of locals, and uh, brought them to this castle to become slaves to be transported to the Americas. These four human merchandises were shackled uh, in the dungeons, where the slaves had to defecate, urinate, menstruate, and sometimes deliver in this place while shackled. I don't know if anybody's been to West Africa, but you know, almost year-round, it's hot. It's you know very humid, 100 degree temperature and humid. And imagine being in this kind of place with 400 people mm -hmm. with you. Imagine what it feels like. You know, while, while the guy was talking about what happened. 300 centuries, I mean, three centuries ago, I felt, I felt that I was being transported back in time. I felt like I was there. I could smell the dungeons, filth, fetid stench. Um, I felt the terror and the agony of the people. Um, it, it was an experience that I've never, ever, ever experienced before. I felt my chest got tight. I got dizzy and sweaty. Uh, I thought I was going to paint, actually. And same with my cousin. Um, again, we have to regain our, you know, our strength and compose ourselves. And we left the dungeon to go to the next dungeon, which was where the male slaves were put in. And this place is quite a bit bigger, and they told us that 600 men were put in there. So, while standing in this dungeon, something even profound happened to me. Something that had never happened. While in the first room, I was feeling sad and felt sorrow uh, for the, you know, the women victim that went through this hell. Um, the second dungeon that held the men, uh, when I walked in, I suddenly, for, for reasons that I can't explain to this day, saw mental images of animals in factory farms. Um, and, you know, just to digress a little, I was introduced to the world of um, compassion and, and animal rights, animal liberation, animal, um, uh, you know, the, the love for animals because of a little dog, a little Maltese dog, uh, nine pounds, who became my guru, my Buddha, my teacher, and transformed me and made me who I am today. And I'm eternally grateful to this little guy who left me three years ago. But I, so all my activism after that was, you know, uh, in regards to dog. That they were my connection to the animal world, and I focused on dogs, and I, I treated dogs, and I helped um, save dogs in, in, in Houston, Texas, where I used to live. Um, and even though I became vegan soon after Nikita, my little Maltese, came into my life, I uh, never really connected with factory farms, uh, farm animals. You know, it's not that I was vegan, I believed in the concept, I watched the videos and I took them, but not until this day that I really connected with factory farm animals. What I imagined that day was hundreds of chickens, cows, pigs, 
and turkeys and other miserable beings similarly reduced to property of humans, crowded into small spaces on top of each other, terrified, crowded together with no space to move, no clean air to breathe, and no access to the outside world. And I compared that with what I imagined that human beings three centuries ago went through. And the realization was so painful, I can't even describe it. The depth of sadness I felt when I realized that although human slavery, even though it still exists, at least officially and legally, it does not, uh, and it's been abolished, and no human being is going through this hell, and slavery is still alive, it's still with us. Billions of non-human animals are experiencing similar mistreatment right now across the globe in the United States, in the Middle East, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia. This horrible abuse continues. These death camps are everywhere. And we tolerate this. We, we didn't tolerate human slavery and we abolished it, but, but we are tolerating this crap every day. And it just, it just kills me to realize that I live and walk and breathe and do all the things I do every day, realizing that not far from where I am here now, slavery is going on in France, and it's painful. It's really painful. The violence and suffering we visit on these sentient beings attest to the deep and far-reaching hatred and the sort of respect we have for non-human animals. After leaving the second dungeon, we were taken to another area which had a small exit in the wall of the castle through which the slaves were taken out to the beach to get on the ships to start their living, their life alternative journey. These, um, they look pretty you know, wide, but believe me when I tell you this, they're very narrow. And, uh, a, a, a normal sized person can't pass through these narrow doors. Most of the Africans that are brought to these dungeons and stay there for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, lose so much weight that by the time they're ready to uh, be transported, they can pass through this. My exposure to the horrors of Elmina Castle opened my heart and soul to what happened to Africans then and what's happening to animals now. I became better able to come to connect on a deeper level with a, the plight of farm animals, like I said. But it also expanded my understanding on, of the complex ways that racism, sexism, and speciesism are all intertwined and interconnected. And the day I came back from this trip, I sat down and I said, I have to do something about this. I have to go back to the U.S. and talk about this. And that's when I approached Bob and I said, Bob, I have this amazing experience in West Africa and I, it's, it's profound and I'd like to share it and we need to do something. And so brilliant Bob came up with the Soul Food for Thought idea, which we developed into a wonderful event itself in San Francisco. My primary target, even though it's for all Americans, especially for Americans of color, because I think they can connect with this uh, on a deeper level, even though I'm scared to some degree that um, comparing animal slavery to human slavery uh, would be unacceptable to African Americans, but I didn't care. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an African, I'm an American, I'm an African American, and I feel very comfortable making that comparison, and I wanted to make sure that other people understood it. Yeah. And that's my story. Thank you.
book, uh, Circle of Compassion, and it was based on my experience in the Udak Castle. And I'll talk a little more in detail about it, but that's one of the things uh, we can talk about. The other thing is, next week, um, I'm going to meet uh, with Don Manfri to speak about, it's a vegan conference, and we're uh, going to be speaking about the Ethiopia and Vegan School Lunch Program. And basically, what this is, um, my organization, with the help of uh, Don Moncrief's Welfare World, uh, we've launched a school lunch program for children that come from very poor families whose parents are, are, are either very poor to provide lunch for their kids and dinner, or the kids have lost their, their parents and they go to school and all day nothing. Uh, sometimes those kids that have families that can, can support them would be eating lunch while these other kids who don't have family, families that can provide them food, watch while these kids are eating. And our organization, with the help of World Fred World, started a campaign to feed vegan food to children in started out with two schools and now we're up to six and we're feeding over 200 kids every day to make this all across africa because there are a lot of kids that uh, need vegan food uh, food period but then also vegan uh, food because that's you know, our philosophy and we're also um, trying to make it self-sustainable by uh, creating bakeries and vegan uh, vegetable gardens so that people, the schools can produce uh, vegan food. And so, if anybody wants to support us, we can. Incredible the kind of leverage they're getting. So again, even 
if people don't have the resources, if you share it on your network, that will help get the, the word out. And if it's an app, you've got brochure, uh, a whole leaf list that we can come in there to where you can look at it. And it's really easy to share. <coughs> Back here tomorrow morning for 8 o'clock at breakfast at the Champions. Thank you.